Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this seventh episode of the IJC, uh, brought to you by the ESCRS. Um, welcome. Um, I'll, I'd just like to start by introducing myself, my co-host. My name's Imran Yusuf. I'm an ophthalmologist and PhD student in Oxford in the United Kingdom. And my co-host is uh, Dr. Artemis Matsu, who is a corneal fellow at the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead in London. Um, so thank you for joining, uh, for joining me tonight. Um, we have two distinguished uh, panelists with us this evening uh, who, uh, whose expertise relates uh, quite directly to the paper we're discussing. So we're quite lucky in that regard. We have uh, Dr. Moore Dickman, uh, who is an ophthalmologist uh, from, um, from the Netherlands, the Maastricht University Medical Center, uh, who has uh, a background in uh, clinical trials for endothelial keratoplasty. So his view will obviously be quite uh, telling in this, in this uh, discussion. And we also have Professor Hamin de Dua, who is a professor of ophthalmology uh, in Nottingham in the United Kingdom. He's a former president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in the UK. And he's also named one of the layers of the cornea. So um, highly relevant, hopefully, to what we're discussing this evening. Um, so just some, uh, just some housekeeping um, tips for, for everybody. Um, this is, of course, the paper we'll be discussing uh, this evening. Um, just to mention for all attendees, there is a, a Q&A button at the bottom, so please, as we go along, do post your questions and comments for the panel, and we'll try and pose those questions to our panel. Um, your video and audio will be switched off, but please do interact, because um, you must have uh, interesting questions relating to the paper. And uh, we'll run a poll very shortly, at, uh, looking uh, and asking for your uh, opinions on the subject matter, and we'll run another poll at the end to see whether um, our panellists have changed your mind on anything. Um, and of course, um, as usual, the recording of today's um, uh, webinar will be available uh, on the usual platforms. So I'd like to hand over to Artemis, uh, my co-host, to run, run the poll. Thank you, Imran, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panelists as well. I'm really excited about this topic today. So uh, we're just going to start with the poll question. It's a quick round, so please get ready to answer. We really want to see your ideas uh, on today's uh, topic. The first question is, do you think that injection of cultured human corneal endothelial cells will replace surgical endothelial keratoplasty in the next 20 years? Yes or no? And the answer is yes by 90%. Very interesting. Okay, the next question. Do you think that the availability of donor corneas is a limiting factor in the management of corneal endothelial failure? Yes or no? And clearly, yes. Great, okay. Right, next question. So a theoretical question. Uh, I don't think we can see the whole thing, but uh, the corneal endothelium, does it have regenerative capacity? True or false? So does the corneal endothelium has regenerative capacity? Fifty fifty percent So half of you think it does and half of you think it doesn't. And next question. So which of the following do you think provides the strongest evidence of the regenerative capacity of the corneal endothelium? First option is techniques like endothelial keratoplasty, uh, sorry, decimates membrane mediated endothelial transfer, descended grafts, hemidemic and cordiodemic, or evidence of success with decimatorexis without grafting, also called decimate stripping only surgery. What do you think? So majority believe the second option uh, provides the strongest evidence. And the last question is, how can we explain reformation of the endothelium in vivo? And the options are cellular enlargement and migration, paracrine signaling, cellular proliferation, or all of the above. What do you think? Uh, 
and the majority feels that all of the above. Excellent. So after seeing what you think, I think I'll hand over back to Imran to present our paper for tonight. Thank you. Um, so for those who haven't yet had a chance to look at the paper, um, I'm going to present just an overview of what the paper um, shows, um, um, particularly looking at the figures. So uh, of course, this is the paper we're looking at. So it's the five year follow up of the first 11 patients undergoing injection of cultured corneal endothelial cells for corneal endothelial failure. And obviously the, the groups from the, from the Far East. So in terms of the, uh, the methods in particular, um, and I'm just going to give an overview of what they did, because I found this quite interesting, not being a specialist in this, in this area. So, of course, they, they used a human corneal button to retrieve the human corneal endothelial cells. They identified those cells using cell sorting techniques, uh, immunohistochemistry and ELISA to make sure they had corneal endothelial cells rather than any other cells. They, of course, screened them for pathogens to ensure that there, there, were no, there was no bacterial or viral infection, perhaps during the culture, which there any, any cultured cells are at risk of getting infection. Um, they then, close to the time of the surgery, they then resuspended the cultured cells after splitting them, uh, they said two to three times, um, uh, to get a final concentration of 1.5 times by 10 to the six cells, so 1.5 million cells in 450 microliters. They then supplemented that with a row associated protein kinase inhibitor to a particular concentration. And during the surgery, they, um, they cleared decimase membrane in the central eight millimeters using a silicone cannula irrigation needle. And then they, they then injected two thirds of the prepared um, culture uh, suspension, which also has the rokinase uh, inhibitor. Um, they injected that into the anterior chamber. And then following the surgery, um, just like macular hole surgery, they put the patient's face down for three hours, perhaps to encourage the endothelial cells to settle where they, they were intended to settle and they gave them systemic and topical steroids following the surgery. So obviously this is quite a unique procedure, so it's useful to know what they did. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you can see the inverted microscopy images of the cultures. So this is quite interesting. So this is to, to see the morphology of the cells as they grow in culture. And, um, and what you can see generally here is what they, what they find are mature endothelial cells. But they do mention that in the top left and the top right, there were some cells which didn't quite uh, look like mature endothelial cells. And they just point the, the, those particular um, images out to us. So this table presents some key corneal indices um, in all 11 patients, both before the cell injection, three years after, and of course, five years after, which is what the, uh, this current paper is to, here to report, you can see initially that none of the patients had a, an endothelial cell density, which was at the detection limits of the instrument. So clearly you had a very low endothelial cell count. And you can see three years and then five years after the procedure, most patients were able to uh, achieve an endothelial cell count. And you can see what the values are here. There was one particular individual whose, whose endothelial cell density was below the, the limit of detection of the instrument still. And we'll talk a little bit, a bit more about that non-responder. Non um, they also present the corneal uh, thickness measurements uh, over time, and also the best corrective visual acuity you can see in the third column, and you can see how that changes over time. And I'll show you some box and whisker plots, which make that data easier to digest. It's also worth noting that for the etiology of corneal edema in this patient group, seven had Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, two had argon-related endothelial failure, one had uh, PXE, um, and uh, one had post-operative corneal edema. So th those, were the, um, those were the characteristics of the group. It's important to know that all were pseudophagic before the operation. So these uh, anterior segment photographs and matched um, shine plug uh, corneal thickness maps show you uh, on the left before the cell injection, in the middle three years following the in injection, and, uh, and on the right five years following injection, you can see that this patient had a peripheral iridotomy. You can see the, uh, the iridotomy present there in the eye, and obviously the significant corneal edema present before the surgery with a very uh, edematous looking uh, cornea from this map, which clearly um, there has been a response following the treatment. They say this is a representative case, um, as is this one. So it's something very similar. So again, quite uh, clearly, clinically, obviously, cor edematous cornea, which then appears much clearer um, three and five years following the, the procedure. Um, these images present for all 11 patients the, uh, the appearance on contact specular microscopy uh, of the central cornea 
um, for all 11 patients five years after surgery. And uh, what you can see here is that in 10 of the 11 patients, you can see the corneal endothelial cells quite well. Uh, they look, you know, in some cases, quite densely packed. You see in particular this case. Um, in the non-responder patient four, you can see that there isn't any uh, endothelial cells visible. But probably they think due to the density of the corneal edema, which makes the imaging of those cells difficult. Um, you can see also the presence of catarta uh, in, in some of these images as well, which although they said, you can see in the, in the legend here, they said they decreased over time. It wasn't really formally measured and presented it as part of the paper. So this is a box and whisker plot showing uh, over time, over five years, what the endothelial cell density uh, is in the patient cohort. So you see the means are presented and the, uh, and the, um, the, the range of the data is also presented too. Uh, and you can see generally the uh, endothelial uh, cell density uh, gradually, you know, gradually decreases there uh, over time. These are all post-operative values, of course. They, they don't show a pre-operative value uh, because they couldn't measure it before the operation. Um, this plot shows corneal thickness measurements. Uh, this time they do show you what it was before the uh, injection. And then over time, you can see the end of the, uh, the corneal thickness uh, reduces with the exception of this one outlier, patient four, whose, uh, whose data you can see here. For best corrective visual acuity, again, you can see uh, an improvement overall um, in the group. But again, there's a single outlier who doesn't uh, improve as much as the others. Uh, intraocular pressure. So again, you can see uh, over time, the mean intraocular pressure stays fairly constant, but there are a couple of individuals in particular, and one who needed a procedure who did have uh, an intraocular pressure of 30, which did require a procedure. And at the end, what they do as part of their discussion is they provide this comparative table looking at different studies, uh, all of whom underwent either DMEC, DSEC, ultra thin DSEC, and then you see at the bottom the current study where they have underwent cell injection. And, and what they wanted the reader, I think in this case, uh, to do is to compare the outcomes for um, at five years uh, from these different studies where the data was present to see, I think to demonstrate how comparable the outcomes were with cell injection versus the conventional therapies. Um, they don't mention any uh, retreatment rates. I guess that was one thing I, I noted was absent from the table um, for, for, for both this study and for other studies as well. So, um, so in, in, in general, those are, the, uh, the, uh, those are the main findings of the paper. So I'm gonna hand over now to, uh, uh, to Artemis to start posing some questions to our expert faculty. So just to remind you firstly, please do um, type in questions that you have for us, uh, for our panelists, thank you. Right, thank you, Imran. So um, this study appears to be very interesting and I think it has been termed as a landmark study in corneal transplantation. Uh, the authors describe a very novel uh, technique uh, with injected cells for a case of corneal decompensation and they present very promising results. Um, first of all, I would like to go through some of the uh, aspects of their methodology and starting with Professor Dua. Uh, professor, when reading their protocol, it seems that there may be some variations, for example, the fact that they performed additional decimeter X's in two out of the 11 patients and how relevant this can be, or also the fact that the first patient received less, less injected cells compared to the other 10. And the fact that they chose people with uh, patients with different underlying pathology, do you think that this can cause some confusion as to the, how well we can understand those results? Is that how you would have um, uh, designed this study if you were doing it yourself? So, um, no, thank you, yes. So I think we have to start by commending the group uh, for years of painstaking work to bring it to this stage. And as I said, it's a pilot study. In the pilot study, you take what you get. Uh, there are bits in the methodology like you picked up quite correctly, and I can elaborate a bit on those, which I found a little intriguing, uh, but this doesn't detract from the principle and the main message of the study. So if you look at the amount they injected, they said 300 microliters, right? And that volume is quite substantial given that the average anterior chamber volume is between 150 and 250 microliters. So, or is it? No, it's, I think it's, uh, uh, it, yeah, in, in that sort of, uh, uh, no, maybe I'm getting this bit confused. It was 300 microliters that they said? Yeah, 0.3 of a mil, isn't it? 
a third, yeah, is that 0.3 mils? Yeah. yeah. So, so in, in, and I didn't get to see the video, but whether they, they took out all the aqueous before they injected it, but there would have been a transient rise in the pressure when you put so much um, in, of more, uh, you know, even if you put 100 microliters into the anterior chamber when you put an antibiotic injection, you got to release some aqueous, otherwise it would be. So that volume I thought was a bit excessive and whether they had uh, uh, looked at smaller volumes and, and, and controlled for that. Um, the method by which they said cleaning the debris off the back of the, the Desmet's membrane, uh, it seemed very woolly. I don't know what they exactly did and what debris were they cleaning because they certainly didn't clean the gatata away. And why was it so important to re retain a Desmet's membrane, which is diseased? Uh, they do in the discussion argue that maybe repopulation with the cells would eliminate the gatata, which is, I think, uh, not enough evidence to make that claim in the study because they gave us no data at all on counting the gatata or quantifying the gatata in numbers or in, in size, but they make that claim toward, in the discussion. So that was uh, information presented without uh, evidence, but clearly it would have been probably better, given that what we know about Desmet stripping only, that if they took the Desmets away for all of the patients and then put the cells back in, it would have probably yielded better results. So I thought that was a, a, a limitation rather than wait for it to tear and then be forced to do it. So that's not a controlled uh, way of, of uh, dealing with your methodology. It is random and, and it's happened, therefore you're going to deal with it. So I think those were, were some of the things. And the, 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 the bit in the beginning, you know, I think all of you must have picked up this below the detection limit of the instrument. Now, with that much edema, most instruments will not give you an accurate measure. And, and as Yusuf mentioned, that when they uh, give you nice pictures of the specular microscope post-op, they didn't have any pre-op because they couldn't get them because of the, um, of the uh, edema. So clearly we know that endothelial counts are determined by specular microscope images. So if they can't get a specular microscope to show us the image, how did they get good enough counts? They must have missed them. Doesn't mean there weren't any cells there. And that brings me to the last point is how did they control for the Desmet stripping only mechanism to come into play rather than their injected cells doing the job? So how did they tell it wasn't one or the other because they couldn't see the cells. Not that they were not there. They couldn't, they, they couldn't show us the cells because the imaging technique wouldn't pick them up. And I think that was another uh, bit in the methodology, which was, so there's a lot of bits in the methodology. I think it'll all come clear later, but uh, for now, I still feel it's a very, very valuable study, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, further to what Professor Dua just mentioned, uh, Dr. Dingman, what do you think of the role of the ROC inhibitor that they used in their suspicion? Could that by itself has, have partially, be partially responsible for some of the clinical improvement? Uh, because we know that the, the reason why they added it is to um, uh, help with the proliferation and the engraftment of the cells, but the ROC inhibitor could actually help their own, own endothelial, their patient's own endothelial cells proliferate. Yeah, I think that's a very good well, point because... That, oh, sorry, I thought was interesting. Sorry, was that to me or to you? To Dr. Dickman, actually, but both of you. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I, think <laughs> no, I would sorry, like sorry. to see uh, what you believe. No, uh, first of all, I, I, I'd like to start just as Professor Dua said by commending the authors. This is really a revolutionary study and it's very important they are publishing the five years outcomes. Um, we do need to remember, going back to your questions, you know, these are still, to my knowledge, the first 11 patients that have been treated, and we are already five years later. So taking that into account with regards to the 20-year perspective. Um, and I agree with everything that Professor Dua said, um, um, but regarding the ROC inhibitors, you know, uh, for those who also have worked, also have done laboratory studies, we use your ROC inhibitors every time that we uh, uh, thaw cells that were frozen in order to improve their survival and their adhesion to the substrate. 
So, um, uh, and I think the w w one of the points of criticism that I had when I read the article, you know, and, and it's easy in hindsight to criticize it, but it would have been interesting, rock inhibitors were used intracamerally in order to improve the adhesion of the endothelial cells. Uh, I think they did not want to do a dysmetorexis because they were concerned. They, they wanted to maintain a membrane to which the cells could adhere. I think that was the logic behind it uh, biologically. Um, but I was wondering, and I guess the, uh, the, I can think of reasons why they didn't do it, why the patients did not continue to receive rock inhibitors after surgery. I think uh, in that case, it would have become a medication study. And from a regulatory perspective, it would have become a completely different study. Uh, with the knowledge of today, we know that the decimal stripping only, when it, it's only limited to a very limited um, population, they mentioned, the authors mentioned that in the, in the paper, uh, the patients that they treated would probably not fare well with decimal stripping only. So it would have been valuable from a methodological perspective to do a negative control with decimal stripping only. Uh, but I really don't think that these patients would have recovered with that. So it would have been methodologically uh, interesting, but not so pleasant for the patients. Um, but I would be interested in seeing what will be the cell counts or what will be the outcomes if you combine this technique with post-operative uh, rock inhibitors. I think that is something that would be interesting to, to know in the future. So if we do this cell therapy, is it enough to do it? Or do we need to combine it with rock inhibitors if we want to improve the survival of this you can't call it a graft or cell injection therapy uh, for the future. And what would be the role of rock inhibitors? You know, we can look at the treatment of patients with endothelial pathology, coronary endothelial pathology as a spectrum. Uh, and some patients were, may be suitable uh, for decimate stripping only with rock inhibitors. Maybe we need to give rock inhibitors to patients before they reach a situation that, that they are clinically, uh, and there are a lot of, you know, the, the, this, a lot of things that are not clear. And I, and I don't think that this information can be gained from such a small study. I, I just want to make a couple of comments, you know, which is very interesting. We learn from clinical medicine observations from years ago and what you mentioned about you know, leaving behind a membrane for the cells to stick to and grow. Now, if you look at acute hydrops, you know, the desmets is torn and the pre-desmets layer is torn, as Mellis and others just proved. And, and we, we published that uh, in ophthalmology with our first paper. It recovers. It recovers completely with no membrane. And the endothelial cells, which are healthy cells, grow across that gap. And it can be a large and they bridge it they produce their own desmets membrane and clear the whole edema. So the proof of principle is there that these cells can grow on pretty much anything this cornea has to offer. The desmets membrane, the posterior surface of the pre desmets layer, or the stroma, which is in an acute hydrox. So, so they can grow. The rock inhibitors, and there are, if I remember right, some papers where they've shown uh, cells can grow without rock inhibitors as well. You can do DSO without rock inhibitors and you get, it just takes longer and it's not predictable. So it's not a must, but it enhances what the endothelial cells and as you said rightly, the attachment, et cetera. So my feeling was that if there are gatata, and you know, sometimes we do um, DMEC now for just confluent gatata in the center, even if there's not much coronal edema to get rid of the gatata and the, and the visual aberration caused by that. So here you are a situation where you're, you're forcing yourself to leave that behind. And I think that they're already way ahead in their study that they alluded to in the poster and other uh, bits that they have already gone past these stages and got something new coming, which will probably put this all in historical perspective. And Imran, I think you need to, you want to? Yeah, I just, yeah thanks so much, Miss. Yeah, I just thought, um, Whilst you're talking about the design of the studies, I thought it was interesting that the etiology of corneal edema in this small group, um, obviously there was a variation, seven had Fuchs, but then others had other causes of corneal edema. Um, and what do you think that says? Well, clearly this is a pilot study and we take it in that context, but how do you think, how generalizable do you think this is to other forms of corneal edema as a potential yeah, yeah. So who you, can you mention who you're directing that question to? I don't want to. Perhaps you, Professor Joe. Perhaps you can start. <laughs> okay. We'll, so, we'll so well, you know, it, it's again, it, it also partly asked the same question with uh, which uh, Artemis asked uh, earlier. Did the rock inhibitors 
help the cells that were already there, right? Now they would do that in Fuchs dystrophy because we know DSO works that the peripheral cells may be more healthy, that there is migration, and most of our understanding of uh, healing of the uh, endothelial damage is by flattening and enlargement of the cells and, and covering the space from where they've fallen off. Uh, so the rock inhibitors would help those cells if they're there. Now, if they said there were no cells, as you would expect in the other two indications, if there's pseudophagic bullous skeletopathy, then you don't go and do a, a, a DSO because there are no cells to slide off or if, if they proliferate, then none to proliferate. So the rock inhibitors are unlikely to help them once pseudophagic bullous skeletopathy has occurred. So it does introduce variables which you cannot control for, but at the same time, it shows that this technique can be applied across the board uh, and it is worthwhile doing further studies with larger numbers to prove it, but at least it, it gives you some encouragement. Okay, and perhaps Dr. Dickman can ask you a slightly different question um, on the same theme. Uh, were you surprised they included somebody with, uh, with PXE related corneal failure or something which might be considered to, to sort of be progressive or ongoing after the procedure? Obviously they put the failure in that one patient down to the fact that this was the etiology. Um, so I don't know if you were designing the study, would you have would you have included that patient, or do you think it's uh, do you think it's more likely, to, as they say, to fail because of the etiology? Well, I think if we, if we we need to think about it from the other direction. If they had only included patients with very easy to treat conditions, that even arises a question if they need an endothelial keratoplasty to begin with, we would have criticized them for doing that. So, in a sense, they 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 took a decision which is which put, may have put them in a very high risk of failure. But I think they wanted to make a point that they are choosing patients with a very depleted pool of corneal endothelium exactly to address the issue that we've been talking about since the beginning here, what is the source of the generated cells? And this is also based on the previous work with animals where they show that really it is the injected cells that are those that, that promote the regeneration. And I think they just chose these complicated cases in order to show that. I think that that's a statement. Um, I think when you do such a study, really your main interest in the beginning is safety. That is, I guess, something that we'll discuss later. Um, uh, that, that's your main, your main point. So, and I think if you only fail in one case of 11, you're very happy in this, this stage of research. But I think that the, from a clinical perspective, the main question that we need to ask, is it a solution looking for a problem or is there a problem that needs a solution? So, you know, in most of the Western world where we are operating, um, there is, of course, continuous need to raise awareness for donor corneas, et cetera. But I think more or less we're able to, to, to supply our demand. I think what's interesting, what would be interesting to see is which um, really patient-related outcomes are addressed better. And I think you see that in your grass when you see how much time it took for the corneal edema to subside and for the vision to improve or if uh, one would have measured stray light or uh, contrast sensitivity in the patients that return their gute, you know, uh, when we are trying to apply new technologies, we need to think also what is, what is the benefit that they bring to the patient and also at what cost, and I guess that we'll discuss that later. So I have a question. To, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Dickman, about uh, that one case failed and that is, the, safety, that's efficacy or is that safety? Because the, the, the success or failure of a technique, my, my simple, I'm not a, a clinical trial designer at all, it would be efficacy, but any of the side effects, and I agree with you because they, they have looked, taken only intraocular pressure, although they discuss rejection and uveitis and all the rest as other sort of safety issues, which, uh, which they haven't provided any data for. But the, and, and if, to, to answer all the questions we've been trying to ask, I think the simple answer is this was not a design study. This was a first come first uh, consecutive case series. So it wasn't a planned study at all. Therefore, whichever patient, of course, pretty bad because you, you take the worst cases, the risk of uh, are less in those patients of making them worse. So you won't take the very 
the, the cases which would succeed with other measures. So they, they took these cases. I don't think they would ever design will have one case with uh, pseudophagic and two cases with failed uh, acute glaucoma and, and the rest with it. I don't think it was designed intentionally for that. It just happened that way is my understanding of this. No, I think that in terms, of, in terms of safety, the, the, the questions that the regulatory body would address was, for example, we know that endothelial cells can undergo mesenchymal transformation. And we know that that could result, for example, among others, in tumor formation. Um, from a regulatory perspective, you need to, uh, the patients would need to undergo uh, blood examination in order to see if there is any spread of these cells in the systemic circulations. These are the safety issues that need to be addressed before you can proceed and look at the safety or efficacy of the treatment from the ophthalmological perspective. I think these are the questions that a regulatory body, including in Japan, will be interested in. And that is why these, these issues were examined. But you mentioned uh, these hard cases that could be uh, so-called salvaged by this therapy. But you know, I'm sure you yourself could have salvaged these cases with the DMEC as well. So it's not like that there is not a, <laughs> another yeah. available available solution. You know, it's not an incurable bilateral limbo stem cell deficiency in a sense. So it's very difficult to choose the, the patients. You know, if I think about myself as a physician, I would need to to discuss participation in such a study with a patient. And the patient would ask me, okay, Dr. Dickman, that sounds very interesting. It's a very exciting new development, but there are some risks I understand, um, but is there also an alternative? And I would say, yes, you know, I can, I can treat you with edema quite well. I, I wonder how would you position, if you, if you would need to, to include such a patient for such a study in your, in your clinic, Professor Dua, how, how would you do that? Well, we, we do that quite often. We, we come up with some patients say, well, I'm happy to help science. And some people say, no, no, I want to try it and test it. And you're absolutely right. Therefore, given those limitations, so you actually answered my question already by saying that the, you, you, you have to go by taking who agree and who consent, not by designing it in this way. So if you ask me to design a study, I would never design it with this mix of patients. But if you ask me to, you want to try it and see if it works, I will take whoever says yes to start with and build some numbers, and then I can give the next patient some concrete information. Well, I've done 11 cases, and I know this is the result. Therefore, and give them some more concrete basis on which to make their decision. So that's why I think to say that this study design is, is a consecutive case series at, at best, at best, I would say. And there's another aspect, of course, that this study was done in an Asian country, which we should not forget, which we didn't mention yet. And in these Asian countries, Fuchs is not the major pathology for cornea decompensation. Yeah. It's, it's, it's these pathologies for which patients seek treatment. And I think in that sense, yeah. the geography also dictated the type of pathology that was, was included in the study. I was just charging in the beginning to say that if they would have treated, you know, very early stage Fuchs, then we would have criticized them for that and would have said, you know, this can be treated with the knowledge of today with this and stripping only with a rock inhibitor, or maybe this doesn't need a treatment at all. So in that sense, I think they really set the, high, the bar high for themselves and the type of patients that they've chosen. And they were very lucky with these very nice results, even considering this very challenging population. And, and, and what does this come See, I noticed this, you know, if they look at the endothelial cell density, they have one, two, three, four patients Never mind the ones that were very low and the one that, that was not in the detectable limit before and after. But there were four patients who in a matter of two years had an endothelial cell drop of 200 to 400 cells per square millimeter. So a huge number. The natural decline you know, uh, in, in an average life, you say it's about something between about 0.5% per year. Uh, and if you do after surgical procedure, there's a more rapid decline. But here, this is several percent decline between year three and year five. And then they tend to plateau out at year five at those relatively low numbers, which is interesting because that does that mean there are some other endogenous cells which were also contributing to this or were they purely from the transplanted cells? I think that question remains unanswered at this point. Because they couldn't, they couldn't see them, but they, they, they can't say there were zero host cells when they transplanted. They couldn't see them because of the edema. And that 
doesn't mean they were not there, like I said in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But the rate of decline was, and this is not from zero to two years. It is from two, from three to five years. So one would expect that the first three years they would be stabilized and the initial surgical drop would have occurred. But when you look to three to five years, there's been a dramatic drop in four patients compared to the others. That's actually something that we also, and I think the authors refer to it, this is something also we see with DMEC. We recently published our national results looking at the longer term outcomes of DMEC. And the authors touch on it, I think, in the discussion. And I think it remains unknown whether it's some kind of chronic um, chronic immune response uh, uh, to, to, to the transplant, despite the, the, the protection that the anterior chamber provides, uh, that causes the endothelial cell uh, count to, 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 to decline more quickly than the natural decline with patients, even after advanced endothelial keratoplasty. And another issue that they mentioned, which I think is very interesting, which is also a paradigm shift <laughs> to, to use your words before, um, uh, is you know, to think about the, the seed and the soil. So also the environment in which these cells are received, but also the, the, the quality. And there's another study from the same group which, in which they cultured the peripheral rims of, of corneas that we use for transplantations. And they related the ability to create a very nice endothelial cell culture from the rims of the transplant the corneas and the eventual decline of endothelial cell densities in the recipients afterwards. So that for me is also a very interesting and innovative way from, from this group to look, to look at the transplant procedure from both the recipient and the donor side. And I, if I may ask a question to the, to the audience myself. So when you do an anterior chamber, you know, this, nobody does it now, but in the good old days, anterior chamber lens implant, which was an angle supported lens, and in a deep AC, because these are aphakic individuals, more or less, so the iris has gone back up, they get central coronal edema over time. And the normal explanation is that, oh, the lens must be touching the cornea and we don't know when they squeeze the rub or something. But what happens if this lens is a bit ill-fitting, gradually it's rotating and rubbing the endothelium at the periphery. And you're getting a reverse migration from the center to the periphery to fill those gaps. And when more and more of this happens, because the density is the least in the center compared to the periphery in a normal person, then the center gets depleted because of flattening and migration. And there might be some proliferation, I don't know, but then this, you get central edema and it does not necessarily have to be the touch. So when we look at these peripheral cells and we grow them and we expand them centrally, if cells keep falling, then there's only so much they can spread to, and then you, you get the outcomes you see of, of failure. But very interesting that 500 cells, you know, 500 cells per square millimeter can keep a graft clear. And this is even after penetrating keratoplasty, they've shown in a small proportion of cases, but that was the cutoff limit that uh, they were looking for 500 cells as success. Mm. And then um, further to what you have probably already mentioned. so. What do you think happens with the unattached injected cells? Do you think, obviously, I imagine they pass through the trabecular meshwork. Can they cause some obstruction? And obviously, the other question is, how do we know how many of those cells have attached? And whether there is an excess of unattached cells, would that cause problems in, with systemic absorption, for example, and tumorigenicity? What do you think, Dr. Dickman? You've already touched upon this, but what do you think? Well, I think that, first of all, that was a major concern. There will be also my concern if I would need to undergo this procedure as a patient, clogging the trabecular meshwork with endothelial cells, um, and also through the, uh, the veins that drain uh, the, the eye to reach the systemic circulation. Uh, that would be something that myself as a patient I would be a bit concerned about. Um, they, mentioned, they, they, they mentioned very shortly that it did not happen. Well, there was one patient that developed very serious glaucoma, and uh, they mentioned that it is steroid-induced glaucoma. The problem is, you know, that's very difficult to say. They say that they looked at the angle and they didn't see cells, but, you know, maybe the cells were clogging the trabecular meshwork further, further on. So I think, you know, that is something, and it was quite serious glaucoma because it was a patient that was not 
being uh, treated successfully with medication and needed to undergo trabeculectomy. So we have one of 11 patients that had such severe glaucoma that they needed to undergo trabeculectomy. I don't know, Professor Dua maybe can tell his experience, but from my experience, not one in 11 patients that we treat that have a DMEC develops uh, such a, a glaucoma that they require trabeculectomy. So that was something that a little worried me, I must say, when, when I read that. But it also may be related to the regime of steroids that is being used. And I understand why that is the case. I think also for DMEC itself, we don't really have now a, a, a single regime of steroids. And in some countries, patients still get intravenous uh, steroids uh, during a DMEC procedure, uh, and in other countries, not, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think that that was something that I was I was a bit weary of. I wonder what Professor Dua thought about that case. Yeah, I think that that is a genuine. Again, like you said, you know, the the regulatory people have probably asked those questions and they were answered because I remember Kinoshita presenting um, uh, data on when they did it in animals. They looked at every every organ of the animal uh, uh, to see if they, these cells were found elsewhere, and they did not find them anywhere else. The interesting thing about the trabecular mesh is that are these cells undergoing apoptosis or are they dying with necrosis? So if they're undergoing apoptosis, it's probably easier for them to pass out. But if they're fragmenting and there's cellular debris, then the cellular debris will attract macrophages, which will then engulf them. And like we know with lens proteins and others, this phacolytic glaucoma, the macrophages become so engorged that they cannot leave the trabecular meshwork and that, that causes glaucoma. But again, one must not forget the fact that the morphology of these cells, whether they're endothelial or epithelial, is very different in suspension, i.e. floating in the aqueous, than when they're attached. The hexagonality and the spread, and, and even what we see as epithelial mesenchymal transition, they've, they, they said they are in two, but they can see another nice cluster in the middle, middle image as well. These cells are taking on epithelial morphology. But where, when they're in, in suspension, they're, sm they're round. And the, the size of that sphere can be large or small, and some may pass through because remember they are malleable; they can change shape as they go through the trabecular meshwork. But what if they're attaching to the trabecular meshwork? Now, one would not expect them to attach to a substrate which already has a cell on it, because there will be contact inhibition. But if they attach to a bare meshwork area, then they could do things over there over time. So it's a genuine concern. I think time will answer it. But one has to bear that in the back of our mind, uh, that and other uh, safety issues, because even though in animals that did not happen, it could happen in humans, and we'll have to keep a lookout for that. But it, 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 I think that the fact that the pressures are fairly stable in the other 10, and they had almost a million cells each, you know, and, and what, I mean, I didn't work it out. It just occurred to me, if you take an eight millimeter disc of a DMEC, which is say 2,800 cells per square millimeter, uh, uh, I'm sure you can work out how many cells would that be compared to the 1 million they injected here. And then what is the dropout rate from the DMEC graph? So you, you can see over time what the count is and therefore how did that compare with this? Uh, only thing with DMEC is we know those cells are not floating out in large numbers at the time of injection going through the PR. They're all pseudo fake eggs, so must of that injection, I think 300 microliters is quite a large volume, would have forced some of the cells behind the iris or into the capsule or around the capsule. And we know that some of it can go through the zonules even into the vitreous, as uh, we see often with little bits of lens matter during phaco surgery. So all those issues I think will be resolved with time uh, and the numbers are too small, uh, but five years is a long time and they would have been apparent if there was any serious concern at this stage. Yeah, I think um, one of the points that uh, that Professor Dua uh, um, discussed, you know, we call it cornea endothelial cell injection. It's actually quite a heterogeneous group of cells that is being injected. And I think the authors themselves present already in poses, et cetera, modifications of the culture technique in order to homogenize the, the, the culture. And when you look at, you know, one of the difficulties that we have with these, with these cornea endothelial cells is that we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have any actually, cornea endothelia are really specific markers 
uh, let alone markers that can give us an indication on the maturity of the corneal epithelial cells. So when you read the supplement from the New England paper about the, these patients when they're first treated, uh, there's a nice 150 page uh, appendix to read. And among this are the markers that we use in order to identify the cells. And you see there that there's um, the CD166, which is considered, you know, not really specific to endothelium, but it, 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 it's considered related to cornea endothelium. And then a very long of markers that shows that there's not fibroblastic transformation. But you see also in the morphology, like uh, Imran showed on the photos, you see it's not in a homogenous, um, it's not a homogenous population of cells. And um, with regards to safety, that, that's also a consideration, but indeed, on the other hand, like Professor Dua said, you know, the, uh, the, the overall safety over five years that, that we see, we don't see any, any strange events that had happened, the eyes remain clear, so in that sense, that's, that, that's very reassuring. Right, just that, that is the strongest evidence. With, with all the other parameters we talk about, the clarity of the cornea at five years. Exactly. You can't argue against that, you know, that is the clinical outcome for the patient. Yeah, with the representative images that they show. And of course, yes. we always have our own view of what representative means. Yes, so we're running out of time slightly. I just want to ask both of you to look into the crystal ball of the future of corneal surgery. Um, we've got a question from the audience which touches on this. Uh, it says, how soon in the future? So clearly this individual decided this is going to have an impact. So the questions are, do you think it's going to have a big impact on corneal endothelial uh, failure, the management of in the future? And B, uh, as our audience members asked, how soon do you think it might have an impact? Uh, Dr. Dickman, why don't you go first? Well, first of all, I was trying to think, again, as, all, as I always do, from the perspective of the patient, what will be a benefit? And I, I, I thought it was surprising that they didn't mention one of the biggest obstacles that we have with DMIC, which is the rebubbling. So we know that in the literature, we have um, in the, the American Academy Technology Assessment, about 29% of the patients require rebubbling. Well, none of these patients require the similar procedure. So I think if I would be talking to a patient about that, that would be an advantage. Um, if we look into the, the future, I think the main determinants, I think it's very exciting and all of us would love to, to, to take part of it. And, and when we read it, you, you think, oh, this is so lovely to be part of something like this. But eventually, the, uh, whether or not it's going to, to, to really catch, and I think eventually it will, but the main questions are going to be, one, what are, what are, what are the real benefits versus risks of the patients compared to the current alternative? And, uh, and, uh, and two is the issue of costs. Uh, because we know from other cell therapies in ophthalmology that once they become commercialized, the costs can become very, very prohibitive. In terms of, uh, uh, of the application, you know, uh, both Professor Du and myself, and he will speak shortly for himself, but, you know, in Western Europe, uh, donor corneas are not that of an issue. The supply and demand is, 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 is quite good. You know, we don't really have an, a problem with that. And um, I wonder if in other areas of the world, they that, that really need that because of shortage of donor corneas, if they will be able to, to, to pay for these therapies. And in a sense, I think we may match that by, uh, you know, offering this therapy to places where they need them, because the, the, the main issue here are the numbers. So I, I calculated it. I think it's a major difference between one million and, 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 and half a million. And it was exciting to see that even with a half a million, they achieve uh, corneal clarity and quite nice numbers. And um, uh, doing that, you could envision that you would help between uh, 20 and 200 patients. And if you see them on carriers, we can now discuss that, which is another option. You could treat between 50 and 500 patients, depending if, you, if you're using one half million or one million uh, cells per patients. And then I think it becomes interesting because if you can treat uh, these numbers of patients based on one donor cornea, then you can, then, then it really becomes interesting. I think one other limitation before I uh, give Professor Dua the word, um, you know, we need to consider which are those donor corneas that have been cultured. If you look at it, these are co co donor corneas 14 to 29 years old. These are not the average donor corneas that we use for transplantation because the older corneas are not that amenable to culture. So it's not that we can take any cornea that we get in the eye bank and we can culture it and use it for 300 patients. So I think these will be the determinants uh, eventually. What is the benefit for the patients? 
and, um, and, and, and what is the, the cost effectiveness of such a therapy? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, going forward, um, rho kinase inhibitors themselves as drops or injections would come in well before the cells. So that will be cheaply available across the world. And uh, we, you're right, uh, more that um, in the Western world, we have more or less got what we want. And uh, I was in my fellowship in the Will's Eye Hospital. We had enough corneas to do wet lab practice on human eyes, not pig eyes or goat eyes. I mean, they were, they were there. But really, the global demand is not uh, met even in a fraction in the countries where it's needed more, uh, quite a lot more, even simply for, for penetrating craft. And not to forget that the, the surgical expertise that we need with DMEC and with, even with PK in countries even like India for the population, they have a huge number of eyes they now can get from patients, but they're not enough surgeons to do the work. And if you bring in a technique like this, which is simple and easy, skill can be easily transferred, then the uptake will be more. And that, uh, that is the advantage. And you can see how it can play out on a global scale in the long term. But the downside is like you rightly mentioned the cost. Now I did speak to um, Kinoshita and one of his team members rather. Um, so what, how's it going to pan out? Uh, are you going to tell us the recipe so that iBanks can grow their own cells and supply or or will it be only one bank in the world who will supply the world? And I think it's the latter. And, and again, just to put in perspective what the point you made more was that the limbal stem cell cultures, the only licensed stem cell product in the whole world for any part of the body is the Holocla, 85,000 euros, right? Uh, to, to buy and to get it set up and run. So it's a good way forward. It's advanced tech, but the cost is absolutely prohibitive. If this is going to be anywhere, even half that price, it's you cut out the whole, most of the non-Western world, the poor developing world completely, because it's not going to be within their reach to afford these treatments. And the ones therefore who need it most or where the need is more will still remain unmet. So those are the kind of ethical, moral, you know, commercial issues we have to deal with going forward. But as a purely scientific issue, it's the right step forward. And I think it will come soon, uh, sooner than we think. Um, uh, it, it will be uh, something, uh, at least in your lifetimes, is something you would probably be having a go at. Um, so, so that's my take on this. And starting with is alone, starting with these other, uh, the more of the, the dismiss stripping only kind of procedures we do, the more we will learn about cell behavior and then we can modify our culture techniques or our injection techniques, or even the way how we get them to stick, because I think that is a weak link. Uh, I remember some papers long back, I spoke at, at the academy on this. People had magnetized magnetic particles, which are in the cells, and then they put a magnet on the top and get them to stick, and this was in dog eyes. So there are other ways by which they can get the cells to attach better. And I think that will be a, a major area to look at for the next step forward, how do you get them to attach better uh, and then, then you have greater density. So some of the thoughts on the future on this. Thank you, Very thank you very yeah. much. I mean, it's just an incredibly fascinating paper. I think we could talk for hours um, yeah. <laughs> about this. Um, but I think at this point, we'll probably move to the poll to see what our audience think about the paper and whether it's changed their views on anything. So I'll hand over to Artemis to run that poll. Thank you, Imran. So as usual, we'll do our final three questions and a couple of them are the same as the beginning, just to see whether you've changed your mind. First one, do you think that injection of cultured human corneal endothelial cells will replace surgical endothelial keratoplasty in the next 20 years? Yes or no? A lot of suspense. Let's check the answer. So less of you now think that it will. I think it was 89% in the beginning. Okay, uh, next question. 
Do you think that the availability of donor corneas is a limiting factor in the management of corneal endothelial failure? Yes or no? I think that's similar to the beginning, so 79% say yes. And the last one. So based on the results of this proof of concept study, would you fund further research on cultured human corneal endothelial cells if you were a pharmaceutical company? Yes, I am convinced that cell-based therapy is the future of corneal endothelial transplantation. Or no, I'm not convinced of the clinical validity of this study. What do you think? So most of you would be generous enough to invest. That's very, very reassuring. Thank you. I'm That's sure everyone will be buying shares as we speak. <laughs> that means that they expect a but lot did of did you, did, you, did you notice that the sample size of the audience matched the sample size of the study? There were about <laughs> 24 to 26 people voting. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be some movement on the stock market tonight. Um, but I just want to uh, wrap up by thanking Artemis, uh, my co-host this evening. Uh, I think we've both really enjoyed the, uh, the discussion and the paper and your company this evening. And, and of course, we want to thank both of you, Dr. Dickman and Professor Dua, for what was a fantastic discussion, some very useful insights into what might be the future for us young ophthalmologists. And, um, and then I guess we, we'll see um, what the future holds as time goes on. So thank you both very much indeed for thank doing you very that. Much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I'll just finish off by just showing uh, what to look at, look forward to next time. Um, so um, obviously thanks to all of you, the audience, for joining us and I hope you've enjoyed it and, and learned something from, the, um, uh, from this. Um, a recording of this will be available on the usual platforms within 24 hours, so if you want to recap and watch that. Um, and just to let you know that uh, the next Journal Club will be next year, 6th of January 2021. We'll be discussing this, ten, this paper on the 10-year safety follow-up and post-explant analysis of anterior chamber fake gyre wells. And the faculty for that will be Drs. Riviera from Portugal and Royce uh, from the Netherlands. So um, thank you once again for joining us, and we hope to see you again in the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, Keep safe. Bye.